Today we're going to conclude uh, what I started last week with the sermon. I didn't notify this service that we weren't going to get through it all. So some people walked out saying, hey, the pastor didn't finish the, the outline. Uh, we're finishing it today and I even threw in a bonus point. So we're going to pick it up where we left off. When I was a children's pastor in Arizona and I had the opportunity to run a weekend children's program for a denomination that was having a conference at their church. All these different churches were coming together on one campus. They asked me if I would do the children's portion of it. I, I said, sure, I, I'd love to do that. Since uh, it was Saturday, I said kids will be very energetic. So we had arts and crafts involved and a lot of recreational games. I had planned for relays, for a lot of activity with those kids. Came dressed with very casual. I had tennis shoes, jeans, T-shirt. I was ready to have fun with the kids. And when the kids started to show up, I realized that I had made a mistake. The group I was doing this for is Seventh-day Adventist, and Saturday is their day of worship. And so little boys were coming in suits and ties, little girls in dresses, and here the children's pastor leading the program is in tennis shoes, jeans, and a T-shirt. And I felt so out of place, so undignified. Parents looked at me like, are you really the guy that we're putting our kids in charge of? You know, I, I don't realize... I didn't realize this is what we were getting ourselves into. This was a very humbling experience. And at that time, we didn't have cell phones. So I couldn't ask my wife, like, Julie, bring my pair of shoes, a dress shirt, and a nice pair of slacks. Couldn't do that. I was like stuck. I can't do anything about this because people are bringing their kids, and I'm here now for the rest of the day. And I endured it. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt you were, uh, you were not properly prepared where you walked into something and go, oh my goodness, I wish I would have known this because I would have done something differently. And preparation is so critical in, in being successful in what we're doing. I remember watching Peyton Manning's retirement press conference. He was telling the press, and really everybody was listening uh, on, the, on the TV, he was telling everyone how much his family meant to him, how much the coaches over the years, how he enjoyed the players that he was privileged to pr play with. But then toward the end of his conference, he, he really made a statement that I thought described why Peyton Manning was so successful. Here's what he said. I'll quote you um, his words. He said, there were other players who were more talented, but there was no one who could out-prepare me. No one. And we all know from watching Peyton Manning, he looked a little gangly out there in the field and, and you know, just kind of walked a little, a little different. He wasn't, he wasn't fast on his feet like some quarterbacks. He couldn't throw the ball a mile. But I'll tell you what, his game up here was so great. He was definitely prepared. I still don't know what Omaha means, but, but he did, and all the players around him knew because he was prepared, and he went in with a game plan, and, and his success proves that it, it worked. Preparation can overcome talent. And uh, if you grew up in Boy Scouts, you know that because Boy Scouts has a motto. It's just a two-word motto. If you grew up in scouting, I'm on the count of three. I want you to shout out their motto. It's just a very simple motto, but one, two, three. Be prepared. Be prepared. Not too many scouts in this room, huh? Or you just weren't prepared for my question, which means scouting didn't do a whole lot of good for you, right? <laughs> Be prepared. Be prepared. In the 13th edition of the Scouting Handbook, it says, Scouts should prepare themselves to become productive citizens and strong leaders and to bring joy to other people, to be ready in mind and body and meet with a strong heart whatever challenges await them. And so Jesus, before he left this earth, started to prepare his disciples because they have a big job. In fact, if you were with us over the last two weeks, we've reiterated this theme. This really is the theme of the book of Acts, this overarching theme of what Jesus is going to do. He's continuing ministry through followers like us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so in order to embark on this journey of doing ministry, cooperating with the Holy Spirit, there are some things that we need to be prepared for, much like the disciples. And we talked about three of those last week, a proper understanding of the kingdom of God, that it's a spiritual kingdom. It's not a typical kingdom that even Jesus' disciples were looking for. They look back at the Old Testament. They remember a king in a throne in a city with walls, armies, very political kind of a kingdom. Jesus says, eh, this isn't going to be like that. This is a spiritual kingdom. And people will belong to this kingdom based not on their connection to Abraham, not a biological relationship, but a spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ. He will be their king. And if they've surrendered to that king, they become part of the spiritual kingdom. He also told them that they would need to depend upon the Holy Spirit. He'd be their helper. He'd be their guide. He'd be their teacher, that they wouldn't be able to do this without him. He would be essential and he would bear witness of Jesus. He would, he would help put the spotlight on Jesus again and again and again. And then we find uh, there was one other thing that he shared with his disciples and that they had a mission to complete, a commitment to this mission to be his witnesses starting right where they are, Jerusalem, going out into Judea and Samaria, 
and then to the ends of the earth. That was their assignment. That's what they were going to do, a big task, and they needed to be prepared for it. So we're going to pick up where they left off because there's three other things that were very critical in their preparation, and that's why your points say four, five, and six. If you didn't catch the first three, you can go online and watch the first part of this message. But we're going to pick it up in Acts chapter 1, beginning with verse 9. It says, when he, speaking of Jesus, had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. All of a sudden, Jesus was going to be lifted up from their presence, be brought into heaven. The king was returning to his throne. And they were going to be confident that he was once again reigning over all. Confident of the reign of Christ. See, when Jesus, when Jesus rose from the dead, he, it happened in the morning. As far as we know, no witnesses. Stone of the tomb rolled away. Jesus comes out and then begins to appear over a period of 40 days. Appears to small groups of people, large groups of people. One time, 500 people were in a place. Jesus gives many convincing proofs that he's alive and teaches them about the kingdom of God. And so here we have this uh, Jesus over 40 days doing this, becoming very visible, and now he's getting ready to ascend to heaven. But he doesn't do it quietly. He doesn't do it secretly. He doesn't do it in the middle of the night. He does it in broad daylight in front of everybody. He just, like a helium balloon, gets lifted up, disappears into the heavens. This is called the ascension of Christ. And a very significant event. We don't celebrate it in our um, church calendars like other churches do. But it's very significant when you really think about what was going on here. Why did Jesus vanish like that? Well, think about it. If Jesus said, hey, guys, that, that wraps up our teaching for today. Not going to see you again. Bye. And he just turns around and walks away. They're going to want to follow him. Hey, guys, we can't, we can't do this. If Jesus is here, we should be following him. Let's, let's track him down. Let's follow him. Let's once again be following Jesus because now Jesus is the undefeated leader. He, he's the king, and we need to follow him. By, by going to heaven, Jesus was really meaning what he said when he said, I'm not going to be here forever. I'm leaving, and you guys are going to be in charge. And so when he leaves in full view of all of them, they have to look at each other and go, he was right. We're on our own now. We're really not on their own. They're going to have the Holy Spirit, but it's up to us now. And so Jesus is is arising and disappearing from their sight. This is the, the ascension of heaven. And I used to picture this like a helium balloon. If you've ever been to a balloon launch, you let your balloon go and you watch it go up and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And pretty soon it's like a little dot up in the sky and you watch it get up against the cloud. You go, there it is, there it is. Oh, there it is. Oh, it's gone. It's behind the clouds. It's gone. Oh. But you know what's up there somewhere? It's just behind the clouds. And that's what I picture. Jesus goes up. He's hidden by the clouds. And it's over. But that's not what Luke describes here. Luke actually describes something that's very dramatic. It actually says this. He said, a cloud came and lifted him. Jesus didn't go up and vanish in a cumulus cloud. This was a different kind of a cloud. In fact, the Old Testament talks a lot about this kind of cloud. It's a cloud of glory. It's the Shekinah glory. When God's presence filled the temple, it was, a, it was in the presence of a cloud. When God followed the Israelites through the desert, in the day it was in a cloud, and at night it was, by, it was in a pillar of fire. So the cloud was, it was not like we think of our clouds. It was a different kind of a cloud, a God-made cloud for a special, special purpose because God's presence is very real at this moment. And some of those disciples remembered that one time they're on a mountain with Jesus, and the Bible says that Jesus was transfigured before him, became gleaming white, and they saw him in all his glory, and it says, and a cloud overshadowed them. It's like a cloud came on the scene. What, what, what's that cloud? Was, it, was a storm moving in? No, it was God's presence. God's presence heavy. God's presence is like a magic carpet to come in and swoop under Jesus and lift him up. He's taking him. Some of your Bibles will say the cloud received him. It means he's being lifted up into heaven. See, Jesus is the king who's returning to his throne. And David described this in Psalm 24. David writes this psalm, and David was a king. But David speaks of another king who made heaven and earth and everything in the earth, including all the people on the earth, and says all of it belongs to him. And then a little later in Psalm 24, David, as he's, as he's writing, says to the gates and the doors, open wide. So the king of glory may come in. And then he asked this question, who is this king of glory? He asked this twice, and both times he gives the same answer. The Lord, strong and mighty in battle. 
In other words, who is the real king? Who's the king of glory? It's Jesus. Now, he didn't know his name Jesus at the time, but he knows the Lord is the king of glory. And so Jesus is ascending to return to his rightful throne. Now, what does that mean for us? Why is it so significant? Well, for one, Jesus said, unless I go, I can't send you the Holy Spirit. So it's good for me to go because when I go there, I'll send the Holy Spirit here. Now, I don't know why that had to happen that way, but according to Jesus, he did. He had to go so the Holy Spirit could come. Kind of like they were trading places. I picture it like a swimming relay in the Olympics. Jesus did his leg of the race, got to one side. Now he's coming back home. When he gets to the edge, you know, you touch the wall. The next person dives in. So Jesus, Jesus, Jesus comes to earth. Jesus condescends to earth. He comes down from the throne he was on. He becomes a man. That's a step down. He steps down even further. He becomes a servant of a man. Then he steps down even further to become a criminal who dies a a criminal's death on a cross. Jesus comes way down to earth, as almost as low as you can get, and then he goes back to heaven, touches heaven, Holy Spirit's turn. Holy Spirit dives in. Now it's his turn. That's kind of how I picture Holy Spirit's here now. His leg of the race, he's got a long leg of the race. It's been 2,000 years. He's doing his work. So Jesus had to go to send the Spirit. He also said, I must go to prepare a place for you. Some of you might remember it, going to a funeral where A pastor reads this passage from John chapter 14 where Jesus said, In my Father's house are many rooms, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for who? For you. And he says, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again so that I can take you to be with me where I am. See, while you and I are on this earth doing God's work, Jesus is up in heaven preparing for us. Now, if Peyton Manning can prepare well for a football game and win, I'm just thinking, man, if Jesus is preparing a place, how nice is that place going to be, right? It is a good place. So he had to go to prepare a place for us. But here's the real reason, the ultimate reason why Jesus had to go. It was because it was the place he belonged. It was the throne he was made to sit on. That's why when, when Paul writes about Jesus coming down to earth, says, and then God raised him up, and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, which means King, to the glory of God the Father. And when Paul writes to a church in Ephesus, he reminds the believers that because Jesus is sitting on a throne that's above every other throne, his power is made accessible to us. Here's how he, here's how he says it in his prayer in Ephesians chapter 1. The immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. See, Jesus is in a place that's above every political ruler there's ever been, ever will be. He's above every spiritual ruler, every satanic evil ruler there's ever been. He's higher than even those. And he has a name that is named not only in this age, a name that is above every name, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And it says, He put all things under His feet and gave Him as head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. In other words, you and I should have confidence that Jesus is on the throne. See, when you go through life and things seem to be falling apart, when there's chaos around you, when there's political turmoil, you know, you see what's happening in North Korea or Iran or even in our own country, and you go, man, this world's just getting out of control. I want to assure you, Jesus is still on the throne. He has not moved. He has not given up his place of authority. And because Jesus is in that place of authority, I just want to tell you, that should make us want to worship so passionately. Because we're not just remembering a Jesus who died on a cross and was buried We're worshiping a living king who reigns even today and hopefully reigns over our lives. It's why we give. It's why we serve. It's why we tell other people about Jesus so they can come under his lordship too. Jesus is a king. We need to have confidence in that. That's the message in the ascension. Now, there's one other piece of this that's very critical in that while while they're watching Jesus get lifted up, I'm sure they went, oh, my goodness, look at that. That's awesome. Can you believe it? Wow. There's two angels that appear, and they're fully dressed in robes, and they say, guys, why do you keep looking up there? This same Jesus who you saw lifted up will come back in the same way. See, in other words, Jesus had once told his disciples, uh, this is found in, 
In the book of Mark, chapter 14, Jesus said, the Son of Man, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus said, that's going to happen one day when you're going to see me again. I'm going, to, I'm going to once again leave my throne, but this time not to abandon it, but to come and claim once and for all all who belong to me to defeat the powers of darkness once and for all. I'm coming again. Now, that, that, that gives him the reassurance that, okay, he's in control. He's going to come in power. That's a good thing to know. But there's also the sense that I believe they felt a responsibility. If he's coming back, we better get busy doing what he told us to do. And there are many times in Jesus' parables where he told a story like this. There was a man who was going away, and he gave his possessions to his servants and gave to each one of them different amounts. And he went away for a period of time, and then he returned and asked for accounting of how they managed what he gave them. Now, you can read. There's, there's probably three or four different parables very similar to this. And so these disciples had to remember, Jesus, Jesus told us about this, didn't he? That he's going to come back just like the guy in that story? Oh, my goodness. He's given us some stuff to do. He's given us responsibilities. He's given us gifts. We better use this for him so that when he comes back, he'll be pleased with what he sees. And the message for you and for me is this. God has given you and me responsibilities and entrusted us with abilities and with opportunities, money, time. You know, all these things he's given to us, we steward it for God because one day Jesus will come back and that'll be a glorious day. But I hope we're not, we're not shrinking back saying, oh my goodness, I should have been doing God's stuff while I, was, while I had time to do it. Let's get about it now. Get busy with it now. So, you, so whenever he comes back, you will be prepared. So Jesus reigns. That's the first message we come to. Second part of the story picks up with verse 12. Then he returned, or they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they'd entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. How they prepared for the work Jesus had for them, they devoted themselves to prayer. See, Jesus had told them before he ascended, um, you can find this at the end of Luke's gospel, you need, to go to, you need to go to Jerusalem and wait until God sends the power from on high. Now, waiting, you could, you could wait like this. You could just wait around and kill time. You could, you know, when you wait, you probably pull out your cell phone and play a little cute game, you know, pop some bubbles or whatever you do on your, on your phone when you play your games, beat a few kingdoms. I mean, you play a few games while you're killing time. But what they did when they were waiting was it wasn't passive waiting, it was active waiting. They prayed. It's like, guys, we got to get ready. Something big's going to happen. We got to get praying. And so they gather together in this upper room that sounds like the same room where Jesus had his last uh, meal with his disciples, and they devoted themselves to praying. Now, think about this. What would they pray for? It doesn't tell us. But I can imagine, I have a hunch of what they prayed for. I think, for one, they were grateful that God's unfolding the prophecies of the Old Testament right before our eyes. This is the time of, of renewal. You know, the, the last days are going to begin. The, the Spirit's going to be poured out. Man, this is, this is an exciting time. We don't know what it's like. We've never seen it before. So there's a little bit of anxiety about or, or fear, like, what's this going to look like? And they have to feel some pressure of, man, we have to carry Jesus' work. We need his help. Uh, we can't do this by ourselves. We need wisdom. We need guidance. We need God to, uh, to work through us. So they're praying. They're devoting themselves in prayer for a number of days. And there's several characteristics about their, their prayers that just um, stand out to me. Number one is their prayers were corporate. They are praying together. It's not like everybody went off and prayed quietly by themselves. They came together and prayed. And there's power when believers come together in prayer. It can be a very beautiful and powerful thing. I often think of what it's like to, um, to be at a sporting event and your team's the visiting team and you're trying to cheer and you're outnumbered by everybody else. But let's say, let's say you're the home team and your team has the ball on the two-yard line in a football game. They need a touchdown to win. There's three seconds left, last play of the game. Everybody that's a fan gets up on their feet. Do you think they're going to stay quiet? They're going to be screaming, cheering, yelling, score, let's do it, come on. You know, the, 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 there's big signs on the, on the digital screens. I mean, everybody's raising their voices. And I sometimes picture us in prayer as a church that, that that's what God wants us to be like. 
You know, he doesn't want us always. Now, there's a place for private prayer, but prayer doesn't always have to be this quiet, silent thing off on our own. There are times you come together and you raise your voices together because there's a synergy. Like, I'm encouraged when someone else is next to me praying for the same thing and praying loudly for that thing. And so I sense that there's this, with, with 120 people, find out later, there's a, there's a lot of people here. It's not just the disciples. There's some women gathered there. There's Jesus' brothers James will find out is a brother of Jesus, becomes a leader in the church of Jerusalem. It's the last picture we have of Jesus' mother, Mary. I mean, they're all in this upper room. They're praying. They're lifting up their voices, calling on the name of the Lord, asking God to, to, un, un, you know, to reach out and do great and mighty things. They're also united. Luke says they were with one accord. So not just physically in the same place. Emotionally, mentally, they're in the same place. There's like we're in accord with each other. We're in agreement with each other. Prayer has the ability to hold people together in powerful unity. When a family prays together, it's more likely that family is going to stay together. When a husband and wife pray together, more likely they're going to stay together. When church members pray together, it's, it's like putting a shield around you that, that really says, Satan, you stay out. This, this, this place belongs to God. This territory we've sealed, and it belongs to God. We don't want you messing with it. We're keeping you out. Because prayer invites God to inhabit this place. Um, prayer it says, God, we want you in our marriage. God, we want you in our family. God, we want you to do your work in our church. When you just neglect to pray, I think it communicates to God and to Satan that we don't need God's help. We can handle it on our own. And then Satan infiltrates that, and he starts to begin, be, begin to bring division and disruption and destruction. So praying together can be very powerful in bringing unity within the church. Uh, a few months ago, we were to have a, mayor's, or a dinner with the mayor. A lot of pastors coming together, having a moment with Mayor Southers, hearing what um, his vision is for our city, looking at as, as churches, how we could come along beside him and do the good things like helping the homeless, um, helping with drug issues. So just about two weeks before the event, it got canceled. The leaders of the event um, were aware that there was, a, there was something in our city that was um, stirring up a lot of tension. A young man uh, who had a gun in his possession had been shot by a police officer. And it created a lot of animosity between um, some of the African-American community, community and our police force. And the conclusion was, we can't come together in this environment to have a dinner with the mayor while this thing is brewing within our city. So in its place, they said, we're going to have a night of prayer. And so instead of dinner, we all came together at Hotel Elegante. We had an evening where people of, very, of, of varied ethnicities, uh, people with church positions, people in community roles came together, and we spent that night praying for our city. Because when you pray together, it's like God brings unity and harmony. And he also brings power. Jesus said in Matthew Chapter 18, if, you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Jesus sees a value in us praying corporately. But I think the urgency of their prayer is what struck me, that the first thing they did when they went back was to pray. It was like, we can't do anything else but pray. We don't even see them. I don't know. They could have been fasting for 10 days. I don't know. But definitely we see them praying. And I know in my own life, when I feel like something's important, that ignites me to prayer. And if I don't feel it's that important, I may not even pray about it. I'll just confess, there are things in my life that I don't pray about. I do a report for the elders every month. I've never once stopped to say, Lord, guide me as I work on this report and prepare it for the elders. I don't do that. But I'll tell you this, I pray heavily every week when I'm working on a sermon. Why? Because in my opinion, the stakes are so much higher. The impact is so much greater. Uh, and when we see something that's very significant, we'll pray about it. So you may cruise along with your life and hardly ever pray, and then your child gets really sick or has to have a, a, a kind of a risky surgery. I guarantee you, you'll be praying because all of a sudden something very important has hit you, and now we need to pray about it. Same thing about gratitude. If, if I take a lot of things for granted in my life, but when God does us like a huge blessing, you know, we, I, my wife and I will say, like, thank you, God. Wow, that is awesome. You did this for us. We are so grateful for it. So if it feels like a big deal, we bring it to God. But when it's not a big deal, we don't. And I want to encourage you to bring more things up to make it a big deal. That's the problem. Not that we shouldn't pray about the little things. It says there's a lot of little things that actually are big things. For example, this week uh, we learned that a truck and trailer 
uh, was stolen from church property. And we discovered that, that sometime during Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, someone had come, broke a window in a truck, stole it, stole the trailer that was attached to it and all the tools that were in it. So Thursday morning, our prayer group meets here. You're all invited to come. Uh, Six o'clock, we meet in front of the fireplace and we pray. And I mentioned to that group, hey, would you all pray with me that, that the truck and trailer are returned? Because I've always had this view that whatever is lost, God knows where it is. He knows exactly where it is. So, so I said, let's just pray God that God would, would open people's eyes to see where it is, maybe find where it is, or, or convict the people who stole it so they would bring it back. But somehow, bring back the thing that is lost. And so we prayed that morning about that, that the truck and trailer would be returned. Thursday afternoon, we get a phone call. Police have found the truck. It was, it was a, a abandoned on Academy Boulevard. It ran out of gas, and they just left it there. And then we, then we find out that the trailer was found. So the trailer was, was brought back. And uh, by the way, the, they, they actually found two guys that they have charged with, with stealing those things. And these may be the two guys who, who tried to kill a police officer recently. So God is using this even in a bigger way. But after, while all that was going on, we didn't know this. Um, the truck was donated to the church by somebody. The trailer belonged to our facilities manager, Bill Delaney. And inside that trailer were some tools that his dad had given him. He shared with some of us that two of those tools were very special, a hammer and a, a measuring tape that's very unique. It, it, it has a tape that goes 300 feet. And he said, those were from my dad, and they mean a lot. I don't use them a lot for my work. They just were from my dad. And so I said, well, I want to pray that those come back. And I, I contacted Bill last night. I said, hey, did you ever get any of the tools back? He says, no, a lot of tools are still missing, but I got my hammer back and got my measuring tape back. So did God, did God answer prayer? I don't know. I like to think he did. I'm going to believe he did. But you know what? We prayed that Thursday morning about that lost truck and lost trailer. One of the men in our group, he's an elder in our church, he said, Lord, he said, we're praying a lot for a lost trailer and a lost truck. But I pray, I, I, I hope, Lord, we would be even more grieved by lost people. I pray that we would be more urgent in our praying that lost people be found. And you know, sometimes we just have to be reminded there are a lot of things that are really important to God that need to be raised to a level of daily importance to us. And that is one of those things. Your kid's sick, you're praying on it like anything. You pray about your lost neighbors, your lost family members, lost people in this community. You pray about lost people in other cultures. Well, we should. That's important to God. And so urgency, we raise things up to a higher level of urgency. It just moves us to want to pray for them more. And then let's just finish off this chapter. This is an interesting uh, story. In those days, it says, Peter stood up among the brothers, and the, and the company of persons was in all about 120. And by the way, he just said brothers generally because the majority of them were men, but there were women here too, but just generically same brothers, and said, Brothers, the Scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry." And now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out and it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language, Akaldama, which is field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. So one of the men who accompanied us during the, all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the day or excuse me, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us, a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward to Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and a lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles." There's a lot of kind of strange stuff in this story. For example, there's a casting of lots, which is kind of like rolling the dice. Um, there's a choosing of disciples between these two guys, Joseph and Matthias. And you never hear of, either, you never hear of those guys ever again. And it makes you wonder, did, did Peter rush ahead and do something that he shouldn't have done? Because later on, Jesus will pick his own disciple, almost like, I'll pick a better one. I'm going to pick Paul to be that extra disciple. Some people actually say, say Peter, who is not yet spirit-filled, jumped the gun. 
But I want to point out to you that there's something really important in the story. I was going to skip it, but then it just struck me that uh, Peter is showing that there's something happened in his own heart. He is becoming very reliant upon the Scriptures. He's becoming very reliant upon the Word of God because he starts to look at Judas and the Scriptures in the past that you wouldn't read these Psalms and believe they were talking about Judas. But now that he looks at the scriptures, he recalls these things. God brings them to mind. Yeah, the scripture that talked about um, Judas, yeah, David talked about it. In fact, the Holy Spirit spoke it through David. Now, let me share, you, share with you something about Judas because Luke adds a commentary that Judas um, went out and he died and his body burst open. Kind of a gross scene there. He just Body burst open, and that field just got this nasty name called the field of blood. From that point on, like people just said, that's that field where Judas died, the field of blood. He, he betrayed Jesus for blood money. Uh, it's a field of blood. And people will look at that and say, well, that doesn't sound like the way Matthew records the death of Judas. It actually says, Judas, Matthew says Judas um, didn't keep the money, so how could he have bought a field? In fact, Matthew 27 says, in throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple... He, speaking of Judas, departed, and he went and hanged himself. So which is it? Did Jesus hang, Judas hang himself, or did he die falling over him and bursting? Did he throw the money away, or did he use it to buy property? What, what did he do? And a little bit later in Matthew, they said he, the li- religious leaders bought a field for Judas. It was, called, it was from a potter. It was known as the potter's field. But yeah, then here it's called the field of blood. Well, this is something where people would call uh, a conflict in Scripture. A lot of these conflicts in Scripture, people will say, like, well, because Scripture doesn't reconcile with each other, you can't trust it. You can't believe it. These are two very different stories, and they can't be reconciled. And yet, on the other hand, others would look at this and say, yeah, these are two different angles of the very same story. They actually overlap in many ways. For example, did Judas get 30 pieces of silver for betraying Jesus? Yes, he did. Did he, did he try to give it back? Yes, he did. He tried to give it back. Would they take it? No. They didn't want the money back. Here's what it appears they did. But they, but they worked with Judas to buy a piece of property with that money. Doesn't have to keep the piece of silver. You've got a piece of land. But that didn't satisfy Judas. It didn't resolve his guilt. So what did Judas do? He went out and hung himself on that property. Probably found a tree, hung himself. And that body hung on that tree for days, maybe weeks. And, and if you knew that was Judas, you probably wouldn't want to get near that. That's cursed. Stay away from him. So he hung there isolated for a long period of time until, uh, until something happened. Either the branch broke, the rope broke, or his flesh gave out because it was so decayed that it fell down and exploded when it hit the rocks. Now, I don't even want to picture that, let alone I'm glad that Luke did not write what it smelled like because for anybody to fall over, he didn't die from falling over. Nobody falls over and their body explodes. It's a bloated body that's already been dead. And so these stories actually dovetail together. Scripture is true and accurate. So much so that when Peter quotes David, he says, it's not David saying this. It's the Holy Spirit saying through David. In other words, this this is the word of God. It's, It's God's words being spoken through human authors. And if it's God's words, we need to treat it sacredly, like reverently. We, we need to look at it differently. I, I, I try to think in my head, when do we recall any disciple quoting Scripture in the Gospels? I can't think of a single time, any of them. And yet, in the book of Acts, they're quoting Scripture all the time. Why? Because they took it to another level. I think, I think they had some, some level of reverence for Scriptures, but after the resurrection of Jesus, said, guys, do you see how many of these things are being fulfilled right before our eyes? This book is true. And we need to base our ministry on this book. So you have one of two attitudes toward the Bible. Either, either you look at it as the words of men and you take it lightly and you pick and choose what applies to your life, or you see it as the word of God, the very words of God, and you hunger to know it and to, and to submit your life to its teachings. It's one of those two. And I fully believe that God's word is true and that, that when you live by his word, when you teach his word, you see spiritual results. And that's why we see that all through the book of Acts, constant references to the Word of God. For example, in Acts chapter 6, the church has been growing, and there are widows who are being neglected. The care of the widows is being neglected, and the apostles know, hey, we've got to take care of the widows. 
But, but we don't have time to do that. So we need to find seven godly men among you who will take that responsibility on. We're going to delegate that work. Why? Here's why. Listen to, to the, the, the apostles' defense. But we, here's what we're going to do. We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. They said the two things we cannot neglect are praying and preaching. Praying and preaching. That's our calling. We have to do that. Other people can do other things. We have to keep our focus right where it is. Because we're going to find all through the book of Acts, it is the word of God as it's going out that causes growth. For example, in chapter 12, it says, but the word of God increased and multiplied. Now, what does that mean? How does the word of God, like, like the Bible multiplied? There are more Bibles? What does it mean? It means the impact on people was, was multiplied. It was having a great impact. It was infiltrating more lives. It's speaking of the impact of the Word on people. It's the people who are coming to the Lord. Greater numbers, greater volume. Why? Because of the Word of God. In chapter 13, it says, On the, the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear, not Peter, not Paul, God. They came to hear God. So they came to hear the word of the Lord. My hope for you is that you don't come to church saying, hey, we want to hear Pastor Darren or we want to hear Pastor Sam or Pastor Matt or anybody else. I hope that when you come to church, you're coming saying, I want to hear God speak to me today. I want to hear the word of the Lord. I, I want to know what God wants me to do. I want to know what God wants me to believe. Later on, there's another summary in Acts 19. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Just, I want you to see how incredibly important the Word of God was for the early Christians. It was what drove them forward. It was the light on their path. It was their spiritual food. It was milk for the newborn. It was meat for the mature. It was their weapon, their spiritual sword to do um, battle with the enemy. The Word of God was so central to the work that we said, we can't do this on our own, but we're going to rely on God's Word. All we need to do is open people's eyes to what God has said. We don't have to come up with something creative and crafty to get their attention. We just need to make God's word clear, and it'll do the job. And so they're being prepared. They're being prepared to go out. You spent the last 30 minutes looking at God's word, hopefully hearing God speak to you. We spent some time in worship um, lifting up the name of the Lord by the way, it was interesting. That word when it says the cloud lifted Jesus up, that word lifted up is translated in some other places as exalt. So when you lift up the name of Jesus, you're worshiping him, it, it, it makes us realize the cloud, in essence, was worshiping Jesus. All of nature was lifting Jesus up. And if nature can do that, we can do that. So we, we spend some time acknowledging him as our king and the one with all authority that's undefeated, victorious. But the other thing we want to do to practice today before we leave here is praying together. And so I'm going to invite you to stand where you are. Uh, we're going to spend some time praying. But I want to preface what we're going to do um, with, with, with just some cautions. For some of you who feel like, I'm not comfortable praying, Pastor, that's okay. This is a step to get you a little more comfortable praying because... If we're ever going to have confidence in talking to other people about God, we've got to begin by talking with God about other people. We've got to get comfortable praying and talking with God. And it's not that hard. It's pretty simple. And my hope is that, that we would be like people in the stands at a sporting event, and we're looking out at the field and seeing God and what God is wanting to do on the field, and we are just saying, go God, go God. And we're praying for God. We're praying for his kingdom to come, his will be, to be done. We're going we're gonna to lift up our voices to him. And so here's what I'd like you to do, if you feel comfortable, to lift up your voices to the Lord. Actual voices. Don't just pray in your heart. But I'm going to ask, ask in a moment for you to close your eyes and just focus. Don't listen to the people next to you. Don't even listen to me. Focus more on talking than listening in this moment. This is one of those rare times I'll tell you, don't listen, but talk. Talk in prayer. Lift your voices to God. We're going to pray about some things together in this room. And you can raise your voice loud. You can, you can be kind of quiet in your voice, but let it, your voice be heard. And if you don't feel comfortable praying or maybe you don't know the Lord yet, then I'm not going to twist your arm and make you do something you don't want to do. That's fine. But for the rest of us, we need to come together and lift our voices in prayer. And so what I'm going to um, invite you to do, I'm going to give you some topics to pray about. And then we just are going to pray, okay? So close your eyes. And uh, what I'm going to uh, what I ask you to do is on the count of three, we're just going to shout out, just to get us warmed up. I want you to shout out in a loud voice three times. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to shout it because he's on the throne.
okay? So we're going to shout it out, and then I'm going to lead you in a time of prayer. So with eyes closed, voices lifted, let's shout it out. One, two, three. Hallelujah. 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 And now let's worship him who's on the throne. Lift your voices to Jesus who reigns forever, who reigns in power and authority. We worship you, Jesus. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you for residing in that place of power and authority that you've made it available to us. There's no one greater than you, nobody more powerful than you, Lord. We worship you. We thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for who you stand. Thank you that you're here among us today. Lord, we surrender ourselves to you. We come before you, acknowledging you as a king. Father Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you that, that there's no one greater than you. Let's thank him right now for his word and pray that his word would speak to us, that our hearts would be open to receive his word, that his word would bear fruit as we obey it. Thank you, Jesus, that you've given us your word, that you speak to us. Your will is not, not a mystery, but it's right there in clear view before us. Pray that we would just hunger to know your word, Lord, not just hunger to know it, but to live it out and practice it in our marriage, in our home life, in every aspect of our lives, Lord, that we would worship you and we would uh, reverently uh, read the word and take it to heart that you would speak to us in just powerful ways. Lord, we thank you so much. Let's pray for something that's very important to God. Let's pray for the lost people around us, the lost people in your family, the lost people in, in your neighborhood, lost people in Fountain, Security, Whitefield, Colorado Springs, lost people in other parts of this world. Pray that we as individuals and as a church may have a burden and never feel at rest with those that are here but still have a longing to reach those that don't know Jesus. Let's pray for the lost. Jesus, use us. Stir our hearts, Father. Make us restless for you. Help us, Lord, to get out of our comfort zones and we would worship you and we would take your word to other people to cross those places of, of being uncomfortable, Lord. And that we would initiate conversations, Lord, and pray for missionaries that we send all around the world, Lord, that they would go to places where, where they don't know you. And Father, we pray that you'd break through and bring redemption and bring life to those that are longing for, Lord, that the lost could truly be found and that they could be celebrated. And finally, one more thing I'd like us to pray for. I want us just to acknowledge the fact that Jesus meant what he said when he said to believers, I will never leave you or forsake you. Last week I mentioned that, that oftentimes we pray, Lord, be with us. If you're a believer, you don't have to pray that. He never left you. And I just want us to acknowledge the fact that Jesus is here with us right now. Let's acknowledge that. Jesus, thank you that you are here, that you've never left us, Lord, and that we need you. Lord, thank you for your presence here. You've been speaking to us all morning. Bring comfort, bring joy, bring courage. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the blessings of knowing you. Thank you for the assurance that even when we've fallen, when we've, when we've not walked with you, that you will never leave us. Jesus, we praise you, Lord. And now let's just raise our voices together as so our worship team leads us in just calling on the name of the Lord, letting him know that we can't do it without him. We need him every hour of every single day.